Well, hello everyone. Today we still linger in the 15th century, but um, during the lecture we will cross over to the 16th because we are at that juncture of the turn of the century. Uh, now, when uh, one thinks of Renaissance, one usually thinks of the Holy Trinity of um, Leonardo, Michelangelo and Raphael. But also think of Botticelli, because he too is part of that uh, group that instantly comes to mind. He was not much uh, older than, uh, than Leonardo, in fact. And, um, but very different. He was very different from uh, the 15th century painters and, of course, very different from the Holy Trinity. He, um, with him, it was almost um, a revolt against the, uh, the Florentine weight and uh, intellectual doctrine. He disliked the solidity of uh, Ghirlandaio, for instance, or the light, delightful storytelling of uh, Fra Filippo Lippi. With him uh, was um, an idealism, but not medieval spiritual idealism, but rather platonic idealism, of which uh, we shall talk a bit. Um, well, for instance, here is his Madonna. They were all doing Madonnas, and here is uh, Botticelli's uh, Madonna. She sits in an open space, in fact, and in an uncertain space. Is she sitting uh, in the interior? Is she sitting in the exterior? Is she sitting in the garden? It is not clear. And what is very different about his Madonna is that uh, this is definitely about the child's future sacrifice. It's not just a Ghirlandaio's uh, um, beautiful Madonna or uh, Fra Filippi Lippi, a delightful Madonna who is just uh, a lovely Florentine girl from a wealthy family. This one has, uh, just as they do, a child in her lap. Unquestionably, an angel is looking over at them. But what immediately strikes us is that uh, the angel, in fact, is offering the Eucharist. He is offering grapes and he is offering wheat. And here, this is what we have, wheat and grapes. And this Madonna is not just delighting in uh, her, her beautiful child. She, in fact, is reconciled to the child's future fate because she is the one, as you see, who in fact is picking the, the, uh, uh, the wheat, who is looking uh, not at the child, but at the uh, grapes and at the wheat. While the child seems apprehensive, as we see here, even the child's position, he is apprehensive about it, he leans the other way, while uh, the angel is looking at the child, with sort of quiet resolve in his face that this is your fate. So she is in fact called Our Lady of the Eucharist. And um, if you compare, here's Fra Filippo Lippi, here is uh, Madonna, and uh, they only, they were painted five years apart. Uh, and the Madonna here, yes, she seems to be resigned, she, uh, she seems to have taken the attitude of prayer, but when it comes to child and the couple of angels, Fra Filippo Lippi just goes all out into these urchins who are holding up uh, this very sturdy uh, Christ child. And uh, the Madonna, we, we, we pretty much know that she's sitting in a gorgeous chair, uh, at the window that exhibits the, uh, the beautiful Arno landscape. Uh, here, yes, she's sitting at the window again, but then there's an open space on the other side of her as well. We really don't know where she's sitting. This whole thing is about the Eucharist. Another image by Botticelli, and that is of Judith, who was uh, uh, a Jewish maiden uh, who uh, seduced the enemy, the great enemy of the Jews, uh, 
Holofernes, who was uh, unconquerable. Uh, she seduced him, and while he slept, she decapitated him. And what we see here is the aftermath. There is no horror shown whatsoever. She is in the process of movement, and then her maid is behind her with the head of Holofernes. Uh, she's carrying it on her head while looking at Judith. Judith is extremely elegant. Uh, both their feet barely touch the ground, or if they do touch the ground, the weight is uh, unperceptible. And everything moves. Now, this, um, this particular attitude is uh, very similar to something that we had seen before. This is um, the Fra Filippo di Pigen, the Feast of Herod, and this is Ghirlandaio, and that's the birth of St. John the Baptist. And as you see, both of them were doing the same sort of movement in the young girl, trying to convey elegance, trying to convey wistfulness. And then Botticelli, of course, uh, does uh, the best job of all. Uh, here is the Ghirlandaio uh, birth of uh, St. John the Baptist. And there, there she is. And as you see in the entire scheme, she really doesn't make sense. We don't know who she is, why she is there, why she looks so entirely different uh, from the um, from the uh, from the rest of the group here. Well, it's very possible that uh, Ghirlandaio did try to imitate both Filippo Lippi and Botticelli, and uh, so he just introduced uh, a very similar maiden into his, um, uh, into his painting. And uh, now we come to actually two most famous uh, images of uh, Botticelli, and one is the Primavera, and then consequently uh, uh, another painting that he painted a couple of years later, which will be the birth of, um, of Venus. Now, um, with, with Primavero, here he really is. He is um, anti-optical, he is anti-atmospheric, he is anti-scientific, he is anti-everything that Florentine artists attempted to pursue in the 15th century. Well, one of the reasons, perhaps, is that um, he uh, spent much time at the, uh, at the circle of Lorenzo de' Medici, and, uh, and that circle was uh, very interested in, uh, um, in Plato. Uh, the philosopher Plato was introduced fairly recently into Florence and became all the rage. I mean, Aristotle was introduced to Europe in the 13th century and became really the foundation of medieval scholastics who tried to reconcile Christian doctrine with the Aristotelian rationalism. Plato, however, is very different. Plato is about beauty. Plato is about the ideal forms. And uh, the Medici circle was fascinated by that philosophy. The um, and in a way, uh, the uh, well, Botticelli, in, in fact, is painting as kind of an illustration to uh, one of the poems. Here, he just conveys this rarefied, uh, attenuated uh, ideal that's very different, actually, that from the medieval ideal, because medieval idealism, medieval attenuation, uh, has to do with Christian spiritualism where this has to do with uh, Platonic forms. At this point, the poet Lucretius, who lived in the first century AD, was discovered and uh, very much discussed. Um, and in his philosophical and didactic poem uh, on, uh, on things of nature, he celebrated the goddess Venus in a single spring scene. And it is possible that that is the source for Botticelli's painting because here Lucretius writes springtime and Venus come and Venus's boy the winged harbinger steps on before and hard on Zephyr's footprints mother flora sprinkling the ways before them fill all with colors and with orders excellent and uh, well, that is what we see, pretty much, the, uh, uh, the illustration to Lucretius. 
from the right we see um, the nymph Chloris who is blown in by the Zephyr. Zephyrus was uh, one of the allegories of the winds. He's, blow, he's blowing Chloris into the painting and then metamorphosis happens and Chlora then takes the shape of the goddess Flora who is sprinkling everything around her with beautiful flowers, with beautiful odors. Then in the middle stands the goddess Venus who is the patroness of beauty, who is the patroness of love. Uh, her little son Cupid is above her. To the right there's Mercury who is dispersing the clouds and one also may think of the gardens of the Hesperides from the classical mythology where clouds were not allowed. And then Seneca was also read and Seneca was another philosopher in the first century AD who talked about the three graces and uh, how they allegorize everything that is beautiful and as they move in a circle they also allegorize the beauty of heavens and how they must always be conveyed either in the nude or in diaphanous clothes as they are described here. The whole thing is sort of a wave right here from Zephyrus down up to Venus and then down here to the graces up with the arms and Mercury, everything moves, everything moves very slowly and uh, it all takes place in front of um, a citrus grove, uh, while well, the gardens of Hesperides had golden apples, here we have oranges. And uh, you may remember Polyolo's The Battle of the Ten Naked Men, that too takes place in front of a hedge. And uh, here, this is what he, he illustrates. There's Venus's boy, and uh, interestingly, a uh, hundred years later, a great English playwright by the name of William Shakespeare, who may have seen an engraving of this painting, he, had, uh, he wrote, Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind, and therefore is winged Cupid painted blind. And sure enough, the winged Cupid in this painting, the painting of Botticelli, is painted blind as he's shooting his arrows, not really caring which one of the three graces he, uh, he will hit. And, uh, and Venus, the, the goddess of excellence, the goddess of love, presides over all of this. Another consideration with Primavera is that uh, is the writings of Marsilio Ficino who was one of uh, the circle of um, Lorenzo de' Medici and uh, the, this platonic circle and Marsilio Ficino was sort of the guiding spirit and um, his thought was made up essentially of two themes, light and love. Light is the splendor of the divine beauty as exemplified by Venus. It penetrates the whole creation and therefore all created things partake of it. And love is the vital principle of universal existence because love is in all things and for all things. It is the everlasting knot and bond of humanity and Venus exemplifies it all. Um, and then when we think, of course, of Renaissance itself, this is the period we're talking about now, when, and you think of spring, uh, spring is Renaissance as well. It's a rebirth of nature. It's rebirth of flowers. It's rebirth of delightful odors. It's, the, it's rebirth of uh, love and light, uh, because the days, of course, are much, much longer. So. There's a very, very complex system of uh, Platonism and rebirth that goes on here in this uh, painting and uh, needless to say, books and books and volumes were written on it and it is of course fascinating just to try and enter 
the mind of uh, the uh, late 15th century uh, Medici circle and how fascinated they were with Platonic ideal forms because in essence it is the theory uh, of um, everything in existence existing here on earth in corrupt form while all these objects including humanity, including human beings, exist also in ideal form elsewhere and uh, once descended to the Mother Earth and having received the outer corrupt appearance, uh, it lost its perfection. And one can see how very close it is to the Christian doctrine and the whole thing about uh, um, with death our corrupt shell disappears and our spirit uh, rises. So such is platonic form. This, as I said, this is platonic idealism, not so much the Christian idealism. But here too you see that everybody almost floats. There is no weight to any of the figures, particularly when one compares this to uh, paintings of Ghirlandaio or Fra Filippo Lippo for that matter because for them physical reality was extremely important because the 15th century was uh, all about the investigation of physical reality and then of course with the likes of Ghirlandaio and uh, Fra Filippo Lippi also a wonderful anecdote uh, the day-to-day uh, -day life of the upper class Florentine society well Botticelli left all of that behind he wished to enter an ideal world of uh, the Platonic doctrine. And then his other painting that he painted about a couple of years later, three years later, is uh, The Birth of Venus. Also has to do with Venus. And uh, in this case, he takes as a base a, a very cruel uh, story from the Greek mythology about Cronus's genitals being severed from him by uh, one of his children, Zeus, and these genitals, having fallen into the Aegean Sea, then fertilized the waves. And out of this fertilization was born the goddess of love. And, uh, well, what Botticelli does, uh, essentially, he takes this very cruel myth and transports it into the birth of beauty in the human mind. And again, it is an illustration. It is an illustration uh, for still another participant in the uh, Platonic Academy of Lorenzo de' Medici, whose name was Angelo Poliziano, who wrote a beautiful poem that was called La Giostra, or Jousting, for Giuliano de' Medici, who was the brother of Lorenzo de' Medici. And here he describes the process of Cronus, well, having his genitals severed, and his genitals falling into the Aegean Sea and out of, uh, of it, um, Venus, the goddess of love, being born. And essentially, Botticelli again illustrates the story. And in this story, as she is born out of the waves, she then is blown by the winds that we see on the right. She is blown by the winds to the shore where the goddess of time, one of the hours, is waiting for her with a beautiful cape, waiting to dress her in the cape. So this is the story. Again, we see a bit of a wave here. The, um, the form of Venus herself is taken from the classical examples of sculpture. Uh, the earliest was the Aphrodite of Cnidos that was carved by Praxiteles in the middle of the 4th century BC and so successful, so popular, so beautiful that sculpture was that of course many many copies followed and one of the copies is um, the Medici, the so-called Medici Venus that was carved in the 1st century BC and that closely follows the Cnidian and this in fact what um, Botticelli does. He takes the Medici Venus with her, with one of her hands uh, covering her breasts 
and the other covering her genitals, which is why she's called Venus Pudica, right here. And he does the same thing here. He also adopts, essentially, the theme of the Baptist of Christ, that was uh, paramount and that was ubiquitous at the time. So all of that is together. Again, there's absolutely no way in our Venus here. She's not even standing in the shell. She's standing on top of the shell. And obviously she places no weight on that shell because otherwise the shell would flip very indecorously and uh, anything indecorous was not accepted. Um, his depiction of the sea is practically abstract, just the, uh, the tiny little birds, uh, little Vs that are uh, spread all over. And again, the winds uh, spray these blossoms everywhere. And uh, our Venus is possessed, or possessed of uh, spectacular go golden, honey golden hair, which she uses to cover herself. Her sloping shoulders and uh, the, the cool skin and this, as I said, the torrent of hair, all of that is extremely enticing. And uh, the form here of, uh, of the, uh, uh, one of the hours is the same as we saw in the earlier paintings today of Judith, for instance, from Judith and Holofernes or the one uh, from uh, Filippo Lippi in The Dance of Salome, or the one that uh, uh, Ghirlandaio will do. The same, same shape, same form, same flowing motion. Very lovely, very beautiful. The entire composition is done in the front, just as with Primavera. Everything happens in the foreground. There is no background. Here, the background is... Uh, is a grove of citrus trees and here the background is rather flat there is an impression of a background which is the sea but all everything takes place right here in front of in front of us in the forefront plane uh, there is also perceptible a circle right here in the front and uh, that same platonic academy as well as uh, as others in Florence in the 15th century discussed uh, geometry ad nauseum. Geometry at this point became inseparable from art and uh, that uh, nature tends to be centralized and thus the ideal form is the circle. After the circle is a square, then equilateral uh, triangle, then perhaps isosceles triangle, uh, then uh, uh, the golden ratio with, um, with the golden uh, rectangle. So all these ideal forms were very much part of uh, 15th century Florentine compositions. For those of you who, uh, who care to read Purizzano's poem, here it is, and uh, here it continues. And we now proceed to another artist, and uh, his name is Verrocchio, Andrei Verrocchio. He's really known as a sculptor. His workshop, of course, also did paintings. Uh, as uh, we mentioned before in the earlier lectures, these uh, Renaissance artists were uh, multifaceted. They could do anything and everything. They, uh, they were scientists, they were artists, they were sculptors, they were architects and Andrei Verrocchio was uh, no exception. One of his uh, best known works for Orsan Michele, we saw the building of Orsan Michele in Florence that uh, served, if you remember, as a granary but also a chapel and uh, had these niches for which Florentine guilds were commissioned to create sculptures. And one of the sculptures is Christ and Saint Thomas uh, commissioned from Verrocchio by the Florentine Republic. What he does here is unprecedented because these niches were really uh, uh, made to accommodate one figure. However, he places two. He places two and the way that he turns them, the composition of the figures, the overlapping of the figures, also the uh, extension, the projection of St. Thomas into our space is all quite ingenious. 
And here we have Christ, and the story here is that St. Thomas is the one apostle who did not uh, believe uh, in Christ's resurrection. And when he did encounter a man who called himself uh, his teacher and Christ, he wished to have the proof of it. At which point Christ moved his garment and showed him the stigmata. He showed him the wound from the... Uh, uh, spearhead of Longinus that was inflicted on his flesh. And St. Thomas, having seen this, in fact believed that uh, Christ indeed was uh, who he said he was. And St. Thomas actually uh, became sort of a patron saint for scientists in the future because scientists uh, do not, their, their credo is we believe nothing on faith. We have to see we have to see everything with our own eyes. We must conduct experiments, and even one experiment is not enough because other scientists uh, must conduct the same experiment in identical conditions, and if the results are the same, then perhaps we can assume that 99%, uh, uh, it, it, it must be right, but still, there is still that 1% of a doubt. So St. Thomas, because he doubted, he's called the Doubting Thomas, um, is portrayed here by Verrocchio. Here's Christ, and uh, he stands above. There's a very little space between them because the niche disallows too much space. And he pulls aside his uh, garment, and then St. Thomas, here in this beautiful contraposto, he uh, reaches his hand towards the wound. Other artists uh, that come later actually have St. Thomas stick the fingers into the wound, very realistically. This is not the case. Uh, here, everything again, everything flows, everything is elegant, but Christ is positioned much higher than St. Thomas. In fact, he's only about four inches higher, but here he appears considerably taller. Uh, and this, of course, is helped also by the halo above his head, plus plus his arm that reaches over St. Thomas's head. So all of these devices, the halo, the hand, give Christ uh, the appearance of towering over his disciples. So he towers over him not only in, uh, in recognition of his own divinity and recognition of his own righteousness, but also he appears to us as physically towering above, uh, above St. Thomas. And uh, also we shouldn't forget that that we're looking, it, it's not very, very high up, but still it's considerably uh, higher than our eyesight. So we are looking at the, uh, at the figures from bottom up that, that accentuates the height. And uh, here is, in fact, our eyesight as, as we look up at this group. And it seems that the Rocchio here adopted Donatello's technique of creating wax statues first and then dipping the cloth in diluted clay and arranging the cloth around the figures because, because the garments appear very realistic. Unlike Ghiberti, if you remember, whose garments are very striking, very sword edge-like and no, no naturalistic creases, whereas here the creases are abundant. Here is Ghiberti with his cloth compared to Verrocchio's uh, treatment of the cloth, which is much more similar to Donatello's. And here we see the two of them. Christ's uh, face is uh, uh, full of uh, calm recognition of his own righteousness. And then here is the back of St. Thomas, who is reaching the hand, his fingers towards the uh, wound of Christ. Verrocchio also did uh, a David. Uh, by this time, of course, Donatello did his own David in the middle of the century and then, so there are about 30 years difference. But um, unlike Donatello's David, who was, well, he was, um, he excited uh, much attention in Florence uh, in the middle of the century and he was considered scandalous for reasons we talked about um, last time. Uh, 
the Medici loved it, uh, and well, Cosi were the Medici who commissioned it, certainly loved it. Verrocchio, however, doesn't go quite into the nudity that Donatello went to. Uh, what he creates is a young prince of the people. Uh, and here he stands in, the, in his almost Roman-looking jerkin, right here. So he is not nude, yet the jerkin is uh, portrayed as, uh, as wet drapery again, because you, one can see the anatomy right here, the, uh, certainly his chest one can see. And uh, the position of the arms is similar to Donatello. As you see, the sword is considerably smaller and the young boy stands there proud of his heritage, proud of uh, his lineage, proud of his city. And uh, his stance is that of a proud Conqueror. The idea of either Judith uh, beheading uh, Holofernes or David defeating the huge Goliath was also very allegorical at the time because uh, uh, the Florentines uh, were waging war against this enormous duchy of Milan compared to which the Florentine Republic was very, very tiny. And it will be Milan first uh, then Naples, then Milan again. Uh, the politics, the, um, the political situation in Italy in general was very unstable. Uh, it will not be unified, the country, until the end of the 19th century. And at this time it consisted of these various, uh, well, first republics, then principalities. And uh, they constantly fought with one another towards the end of the century. Um, the French will invade uh, the, um, the peninsula and for, for a long, long time uh, the peninsula will be fighting for its life and it is extraordinary to think that it's during that time that, that so many spectacular works of art were created. But uh, going back to the Florentines in particular and David, they saw David, a young teenager, defeating these, this enormous Goliath as the allegory of their own fight against impossible odds, against uh, the enormous principality of Milan, then uh, Naples, Milan again. Uh, and that is uh, one of the reasons why uh, this, uh, the whole idea of David was very popular in Florence. As I said, Verrocchio was not really a painter, but of course he painted when uh, necessity commanded or when he was commissioned to paint. This particular painting is famous because it is very likely that the uh, very young Leonardo da Vinci uh, took part in painting it, particularly in painting this, the angel to our left. And Leonardo da Vinci was a pupil in uh, an apprentice in Verrocchio's shop. Uh, the composition is uh, just, this is a general composition of the uh, baptism of Christ. And uh, here we see Christ in the middle, John the Baptist to the side against the rocks. And uh, the two angels observing the scene, the two angels sit under a palm tree, which is another allegory of eternity. Uh, we see Christ standing in, uh, in contraposto, in the water, and uh, the, uh, his feet, as a result, look that they are in the water. Uh, his loincloth is, uh, is almost falling off, but then we saw this in Masaccio as well, in his Trinity, so perhaps that became uh, the convention of uh, Christ's pubic hair, in fact almost always shown uh, while his loincloth is falling off. But it is this face that made this painting very famous. And also there are some uh, art historians that argue that the landscape was also painted by the very young Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, here is the angel and it's difficult to see in the reproduction but uh, while one angel is painted with the 15th century adherence to visual reality, there appears to be uh, this typical Leonardo's fumato when uh, 
when the imagery becomes diaphanous almost, when imagery uh, becomes uh, as if seen through a diaphanous uh, cloth. And that's what we see with this, um, with this angel. And thus we uh, transition to Leonardo da Vinci. Um, he's born in 52, so in this painting he would be uh, 23 years old. He was born in the middle of the century, as you see, and uh, he died in the early 16th century. What set Leonardo aside from everyone else was his profound conviction that art and science are interrelated, not mutually exclusive, not even interchangeable. They are entirely and completely related. To him, science was an expression of reality and art was an expression of beauty. And reality as it was created by God must be beautiful. And that's where art comes into, uh, into play to show the world how beautiful is scientific creation. He rejected all authority. Leonardo da Vinci should have been born with the name of Thomas uh, because uh, the doubting Thomas certainly was his patron saint. He doubted absolutely everything. He took, he took nothing on faith. He, uh, we don't know much about his Christian beliefs. Uh, well, he believed in nature. That's what he believed in. And uh, as a result, he pretty much rejected all tradition and all convention whether it is scriptural or whether it's traditional. He, uh, uh, he left hundreds of sketches, scientific sketches, and in these sketches he investigated nature, nature in, in all its manifestations. Uh, he investigated the position of a fetus inside the mother's womb. He investigated uh, human coitus uh, also in his sketches. In fact, to make a sketch like this, he waited for a pregnant woman to die in childbirth and then the fetus, of course, to die inside of her as well. At this point, the Christian prohibition on uh, dissection of corpses was, uh, if not lifted by authorities, at least was looked at uh, with tolerance. And because of that, Leonardo was able to create the images that we see now. As you see, he actually came up with Velcro. Uh, here are his uh, depictions of the heart, human body, human skeleton. Um, an extraordinary man, really. He, um, he was born, he was an illegitimate son of a notary, a Florentine notary, who was like today's attorney, and um, a peasant girl from the town of Vinci. He was taken from uh, the girl to the notary's uh, household and educated, educated there. He was left-handed from birth, which uh, was not well accepted at the time. And in fact, in Italian, left is sinistro, and translates to English as sinister. And this idea of something is wrong with you if you're left-handed was uh, quite embedded in uh, contemporaneous uh, psychology. He was not only left-handed, but he also drew and wrote from right to left, not from left to right. So as a result, all these notes here are written in mirror script. Not only he, he wrote from right to left, but he also wrote in mirror script. So today, a non-specialist who wishes to read Leonardo's writing would have to put a mirror to it. Uh, that obviously did not apply to letters that he wrote to friends and superiors, uh, those he wrote from left to right in regular script. But uh, his investigation was constant. He, um, uh, his notes indicate his, um, his ideas about architecture. And he too felt, well, he knew that nature tended to be centralized. And as a result, in his architectural drawings, 
the buildings usually are centralized. And even though this particular building was not built, nevertheless, his investigations and his sketches served as examples to future, to future architects. He, uh, he thought about uh, flying machines, he thought about scuba equipment, he, uh, he was a military engineer, he spent in fact 20 years in Milan, he was not uh, devoted to Florence, uh, I mean, he was devoted only to science. Uh, even less to art. Science was number one and art existed in order to convey the beauty of science. As a result, we really don't have too many of uh, Leonardo's paintings. They can be counted on uh, really on, on two hands, if that, because he was always distracted by something else. He was always distracted by his signs. Uh, he invented a machine for for grinding concave glass and, uh, and thus showed the way to the creating of a telescope. Uh, here is the inner system of, uh, of a man and uh, he in fact was an anatomist as well as he was a botanist, as well as he was a geologist. He is the one who he uh, climbed uh, rocks and uh, mountains incessantly and uh, during his climbing he, he saw uh, petrified remains of ancient bones and as a result did come to the conclusion that uh, the world certainly was not created in, in 4004 as the Bible maintained. So he knew the world was created much, much earlier than that.